welcome in this module on atrial septal defects we'll be going through the echocardiograph echocardiographic descriptions of all types of atrial septal defects we know that about 80 percent of the atrial septal defects will be of the ostium secundum type around 10 percent will be primum defects or in other words partial AV canal defects close to another 10 percent will be the superior vena cable type of sinus venosus defects there are very rare entities like coronary sinus type of atrial septal defects which we will be describing later this module will end with a discussion on patent foramen ovale and lutum basher syndrome the commonest form of secundum atrial septal defect are the most amenable for non-surgical interventions and hence generate increasing interest from all the cardiologists. When we talk about a secundum atrial septal defect in the context of device closure, we need to understand all the rims around the atrial septal defect. The rim that is closer to the superior vena cava will be this superior rim or the SVC rim. And diagonally opposite to that will be the inferior rim or inferior vena cable rim. The rim posteriorly between the superior and inferior vena cava will be called as the atrial margin or the pulmonary venous margin or the posterior margin. Anteriorly the atrial septal defect will be associated to the aortic root antero superiorly and the tricuspid and the mitral annulus antero inferiorly. So the antero superior rim will be called as the retro aortic rim and the antero inferior rim will be called as the mitral or tricuspid rim. This is a three dimensional echocardiogram. The advantage of three-dimensional echocardiogram is a good spatial relationship understanding on the volume rendered images. What we see on the left is a cartoon of the atrial septum. The right atrial free wall has been excised and the intraatrial septum is exposed. We are seeing the superior and inferior vena cava draining from the upper and lower margins of the atrial septum. The tricuspid valve is seen antero inferiorly and the aortic root is displayed antero superiorly. Now this cartoon can actually be shown live using a three-dimensional echocardiogram. On the right side of the movie, which is a three-dimensional echo, a volume rendered image, the entire atrial septum, right atrial surface is shown. You can appreciate on the top the superior vena cava entry. You can appreciate to the right side of the screen the aortic root, the aortic valve leaflets and the ascending aorta. You can appreciate on the right side of the screen a little below the aortic root, the tricuspid valve annulus and on the left side of the screen is the posterior margin. This ASD is located in the middle of fossa ovalis. The same 3D volume rendered unfast image from the right atrial septal surface is further cropped so that a very thin slice passing through the intraatrial septum is now obtained. The ASD is shown in the center. Five arrows point to the aortic margin, the mitral or the tricuspid margin, the inferior IVC margin, superior SVC margin, and the posterior pulmonary venous margin. In this still frame from the previous movie, we can appreciate the ascending aorta, aortic root and the aortic valves 
remnants of the tricuspid valve which is shown in the antro inferior margin above and below the superior and the inferior margin and posteriorly the atrial margin or the pulmonary venous margin this three dimensional understanding of the atrial septal defect is very important for conceptualizing a device closure of the atrial septal defect another example of a second atrial septal defect is shown here the right atrial view is seen on fast the entire right atrial free margin has been cropped out you can appreciate the superior and the inferior vena cava above and below the location of the aortic root is pointed out the term tv indicates the region of the tricuspid valve the septal tricuspid annulus is shown and this will be the unfas representation of an atrial septal defect from the right atrial surface when we play the 3d echocardiographic loop we can identify the aortic root and the aortic valve leaflets and the superior leaf the gutter of the superior vena cava superiorly the hollow entry point of the inferior vena cava inferiorly and the tricuspid annulus seen antro inferiorly we notice that this atrial septal defect is located on the upper half of the region of fossa ovalis the thinned out portion of the fossa ovalis seen inferiorly will represent the thin inferior margin with this understanding of the cartoon of the atrial septum showing the atrial septal defect and the three dimensional right atrial surface on fast view we will go on to the traditional echocardiographic views that we get on transthoracic echocardiogram we identify and analyze an atrial septal defect in three different views one will be the subsifoid view the second will be the epical view and the third will be the parasternal view we are going to explain in each and every view how to visualize the atrial septum how to delineate the atrial septal defect and how to identify the margins in each of these views once again to summarize the margins the retroaortic margin is defined as the antro superior margin the atrioventricular valve or the mitral or the tricuspid margin is the antro inferior margin the inferior vena cava margin is the inferior margin the superior vena cava margin is the superior margin the pulmonary vein margin is the posterior margin we will start with the analysis of an atrial septal defect from the epical view when we view from the apex of the heart the probe is kept in the fifth or sixth intercostal space in and around the midclavicular line from the region where we palpate the apex of the heart clinically here the probe is in the most anterior portion of the patient so the margin that is going to be very very close to the transducer is going to be the anterior and inferior margin it is inferior because we are viewing the heart from the apex the margin that is far away from the transducer is the diagonally opposite margin which is the posterior superior margin on the cartoon that is seen on the right lower end of the screen we have passed a cut from the apex of the heart all the way going through the 
ventricle and atria through the AV valves up to the posterior margin of the heart. We can identify that the transducer B will cut the atrial septal defect in its middle and the margin that is closer to the transducer will be the margin that is related to the mitral and tricuspid valve. This is in other words the antero inferior margin. The other margin that will be cut farther away from the transducer will be the posterior superior diagonally opposite rim. This is a short loop of the apical view of a patient with atrial septal defect. We can notice the right atrial and right ventricular dilatation due to the left right shunt. We can identify the atrial septal defect in the middle of the atrial septum. The margin that is closer to the transducer, which is located below, is the antero inferior mitral margin. The margin that is farther away from us, seen on the upper end of the screen, is the posterior superior margin. When we freeze the frame and put a cursor on the two margins, the lower marker indicates the antero inferior margin and the upper marker indicates the posterior superior margin. Another example of the same apical four chamber view. The transducer is below. The transducer has been kept over the apex of the heart. We see the four chambers. The right atrium and right ventricle are dilated due to the large left right shunt. We are having two cursors placed on the margins of the atrial septal defect. The cursor that is closer to the transducer is the antero inferior mitral margin and the cursor that is farther away from the transducer is the posterior superior margin. Compared to the previous example that was shown, in this patient the posterior superior margin is far more extensive. So this is a much more longer posterior superior margin and a smaller antero inferior mitral margin. Many examples of the apical view are shown now in series to reinforce the concept of antero inferior and posterior superior margins. In this last example of apical four chamber view that is shown, we can virtually identify that there is no antero inferior margin at all. The diagonally opposite posterior superior margin is very well developed. When we run the apical four chamber loop of the last example that was shown, we can identify the tricuspid and the mitral valves. There is an atrial septal defect which is located very, very apically. There is no margin that is separating the atrial septal defect's lower margin from the mitral annulus. We need to differentiate this very clearly from a primum atrial septal defect. If you carefully see, the tricuspid valve attachment is located more epically. The mitral valve attachment is located at a superior plane. This offsetting of the tricuspid and mitral annulus is a characteristic feature of all normal hearts. In primum atrial septal defect or partial AV canal, the right and the left AV valve components will have attachment at the same level. There will not be an offsetting between the right sided and left sided AV valve components. However, in this example we can very distinctly see the tricuspid valve attachments more epically and the mitral valve attachment more cranially. This is an example of a secondary atrial septal defect 
with almost absent mitral margin and a well developed posterior superior margin. This absence of mitral margin or the anterior inferior margin can be better understood when we do a transesophageal echocardiogram and get a three dimensional volume loop. This is a 3D echocardiogram. A view from the left atrial roof. We can appreciate a large atrial septal defect with a thin posterior superior margin that is displayed. On the right side of the screen is the tricuspid valve and the partially shown on the left side is the mitral valve. The aortic root is displayed anteriorly. We can appreciate that the second atrial septal defect which is very large has no margin of tissue from the region of the atrioventricular valves. So this is a complete absence of mitral margin. The tricuspid valve is better appreciated as a three leaflet structure when the leaflets close during systole. We can appreciate the bluish tinge of the tricuspid valve leaflets when the leaflets close. From the apical view, now we move on to the next view, the parasternal short axis view. In the previous apical view, we were trying to take a section of the heart from the apex, that is from below the heart. So we were cutting the antero inferior and the postero superior margin. However, on a parasternal short axis view, as shown in the cartoon on the right lower end of the screen, the atrial septum is going to be sectioned in an opposite plane. So the transducer beam will be hitting the ascending iota followed by that the antero superior retro aortic rim followed by that will be the postero inferior margin and so what will be seen closer to the transducer will be the antero superior margin and what is seen farther away from the transducer will be the postero inferior margin. In this parasternal short axis small movie we can appreciate the aortic root in the center with a tri-leaflet aortic valve. We can see the left atrium posteriorly and the right atrium posteriorly and to the left end of the screen. A large atrial septal defect is shown. The margin of the atrial septal defect which is closer to the aortic root and closer to the transducer is the anterosuperior margin. In this example the anterosuperior retroaortic margin is virtually absent. There is a well developed postro inferior margin that is seen at the other end of the screen. When we freeze the frame, we can appreciate that the two cursors are placed on the antero superior retroaortic margin and postero inferior margin. Another example of a same parasternal short axis view we can appreciate the left atrium behind the aortic root, the dilated right atrium and the right ventricle, a large atrial septal defect is shown. In contrast to the previous example where there was no retroaortic rim, here there is a good well formed retroaortic rim. So there is a well formed antero superior margin. However, the postero inferior margin is defective is deficient. Let us now move on to the subsified views. Subsified view can be obtained in the coronal plane and in the sagittal plane. When we say that subsified cut in coronal plane, we mean the marker of the transducer is placed towards the left side of the patient. 
The cartoon that is seen on the right lower end of the screen shows the plane in which an atrial septal defect will be cut by a subsified coronal sweep. The echocardiographic image shown on the top shows the anterior and the posterior margin on the right side and left side of the image respectively. In this movie of the subsified coronal view, we have the right atrium closer to the transducer and left atrium farther away from the transducer. We can notice the large color flows from the left atrium into the right atrium through the second atrial septal defect and it is color coded red. The margin on the right side of the screen will be the margin that is closer to the atrioventricular valves and so that is the anterior margin. The margin that is seen on the left side of the screen will be the margin that will be closer to the right pulmonary veins and so that will be the posterior margin. In this frozen frame of subsified coronal view, we can notice that Two cursors are placed on either of the margins. The margin that is noted to the right side of the screen is the anterior margin in close relation to the atrioventricular valves. And the margin on the left side of the screen is the margin that is in close relation to the right pulmonary veins and that will be the posterior margin. After a subsifoid imaging by keeping the transducer in a coronal plane, now we go on to subsifoid imaging by keeping the transducer in a sagittal plane. This is also called as the short axis view. When we say that we are keeping the transducer in a sagittal plane, we mean the marker of the, pay of the transducer should be in contact with the patient's abdominal wall and in this plane we will be cutting the atrial septum as shown in the picture seen on the right lower end of the screen. The transducer slice will be passing through the atrial septum from above downwards and we will be able to visualize the superior and the inferior margins in this subsifoid short axis sagittal plane cut. This is a subsifoid short axis view. We are viewing from below. So the superior vena cava draining into the right atrium is seen on the upper half of the image. Behind the superior vena cava you find a large circular structure which represents the cross section of the right pulmonary artery. The right pulmonary artery courses transversely in the mediastinum posterior to the superior vena cava. And so the large round structure is the cross section of the right pulmonary artery seen behind the superior vena cava. In the center of the screen you see the large dilated right atrium and next to that is the smaller left atrium. The atrial septal, septum separates the two atria. We are able to appreciate an atrial septal defect of moderate size. The margin that is seen superiorly in the upper end of the screen is the superior margin which is in close relation to the superior vena cava. The margin that is seen inferiorly, diagonally opposite to the superior margin, is the inferior margin. In this patient, the inferior margin is very well developed. We can notice a small stub of tissue in the dilated right atrium at the lower end of the screen, and that is the eustachian valve. Eustachian valve is a structure that is seen on the anterior lip of the inferior vena cavo atrial junction. 
in this frozen frame of subsified sagittal short axis view we can identify the superior vena cava pointed out with an arrow the eustachian valve arises from the anterior lip of the inferior vena cava right atrial junction the large right atrium is seen closer to the transducer at the lower half of the screen the smaller left atrium is seen at the upper half of the screen the atrial septal defect is shown between the left and the right atrium the upper cursor has been placed on the superior margin and the lower cursor is placed on the inferior margin the round structure that is seen posterior to the right superior vena cava is the right pulmonary artery the cross section of the right pulmonary artery this is a subsified short axis view a small movie clip of a patient with a large atrial septal defect we can notice the large right superior vena cava entering the right atrium a very large atrial septal defect there is a margin that is seen superiorly which will represent the superior vena cava or the superior margin posterior to the superior vena cava is the cross section of the right pulmonary artery there is no inferior vena cava ivc margin at all we can notice the inferior vena cava and a short stump of an eustachian valve that is arising from the anterior lip of the inferior vena cava right atrial junction we should not mistake the small lip of the eustachian valve as a portion of the atrial septal margin the atrial septal plane is posterior to the plane of inferior vena cava right atrial junction eustachian valve is attached to the anterior lip of the inferior vena cava right atrial junction when we freeze the frame of the previous example we can appreciate the superior and the inferior vena cava the superior and the inferior margins of the atrial septal defect shown by two cursors we can notice that there is a well formed superior margin but absent inferior margin on the anterior margin of the inferior vena cava right atrial junction we can see the eustachian valve posterior to the right superior vena cava is the cross section of the right pulmonary artery once again we reiterate not to mistake the eustachian valve's free edge as a margin of the in, of the atrial septal defect the atrial septal defect plane that is shown by the two cursors is posterior to the inferior vena cava right atrial junction the eustachian valve is anterior to the inferior vena cava right atrial junction in this example of a subsified short axis view we again see the superior vena cava in the inferior margin of this atrial septal defect is very thin and neurismal and floppy this will be described as thin floppy inferior margin having gone through these three views epical view the parasternal short axis view and the subsified view we can identify different margins in different views when we view from the epical four chamber view we can see the antero inferior mitral margin and diagonally opposite to that will be the postero superior margin when we view from the parasternal short axis we see the antero superior retroaortic margin and the diagonally opposite postero inferior margin when we view from the subsified sagittal view we view the superior on the superior vena cava margin or the inferior on the ivc margin on a subsified coronal plane we'll be viewing the anterior and the posterior margins now let us move on to transesophageal echocardiogram
on how we identify all the margins on a transesophageal echocardiogram. The transesophageal echo probe is advanced to around 25 to 30 millimeters from the incisor teeth. And in this location will be behind the plane of the atria. When we say a zero degree cut, it's a horizontal slicing of the heart. And so the probe plane will be going on a horizontal plane. When we rotate the transduce the plane to 90 degree, we'll be making a vertical slice of the heart, which will pass through the superior and inferior vena cava, and so is also called as the bicaval view. Between the 0 degree and 90 degree will be around 45 degrees which will be cutting the atrial septum from the antero superior plane to the postero inferior plane. When we move the transducer much beyond 90 degree to a plane around 120 to 130 degrees we will be cutting the atrial septum in a plane along the mitral and tricuspid margin and the posterior superior plane. The cartoon that is described on the right lower end of the screen will show the various planes in which we are cutting in different views of transesophageal echocardiogram. We need to understand the planes on which we are cutting in each of the angles very clearly for identifying the respective margins of the atrial septal defect. Let us start with the zero degree plane of transesophageal echocardiogram. On the left side of the screen is the cartoon of a heart, a cartoon of the transesophageal echo probe and we show on which plane we are going to cut the atrial septum. The cut goes horizontally. It's going to cut on the anterior and the posterior margins. So when we see the image on the right side of the screen, whatever is displayed is the anterior margin and the posterior margin. In this transesophageal echo loop recorded in zero degree plane, which means a horizontal slicing of the heart, we can see the left atrium closer to the transducer, the right atrium farther away from the transducer. A large atrial septal defect is shown. The margin that is seen on the right hand of the screen, which is closer to the aortic root, is the anterior retroaortic margin. The margin that is seen on the left hand of the screen, which is closer to the right pulmonary veins, is the posterior margin of the atrial septal defect. This is another example of a large atrial septal defect. In contrast to the previous example that was shown, here there is no anterior rim, there is no margin behind the aortic root and even the posterior margin that is seen on the opposite side is almost virtually absent. So this is an example of a large atrial septal defect with no significant margin on both the anterior and posterior aspects. Another example that is showing an absent antero superior retroaortic margin. However, the posterior margin, even though it is thin, is well formed. A still frame of a transesophageal echocardiogram in zero degree plane showing total absence of the posterior margin. The posterior margin is now seen on the left hand side of the screen. The anterior margin is seen on the right hand side of the screen. 
Now we move on to rotate the probe to a 45 degree plane. At 0 degree plane, we were making a horizontal slice of the heart. But on 45 degree plane, it is going to be a oblique slice of the heart. On the left side of the screen, we have shown a small cartoon which demonstrates the plane at which the atrial septum is being sliced. It goes through the anterosuperior retroaortic margin and the posteroinferior margin. So these margins are displayed on the echocardiographic display. This is a view of an atrial septal defect seen in around 45 to 50 degree view. We can appreciate the atrial septal defect. The margin that is seen on the right hand of the screen is the anterosuperior margin and the long margin that is seen on the posteroinferior portion of the atrial septum is displayed on the left hand of the screen. We can also appreciate the inferior vena cava draining into the right atrium. The margins that are displayed at a 45 degree view will represent the anterosuperior and the posteroinferior margins. In the previous movie, we were able to appreciate the inferior vena cava entering the right atrium along the posteroinferior margin of the atrial septal defect. When we pull up the transducer to an upper plane, in the esophagus, we will be able to appreciate the aortic root and the ascending aorta. And we can notice that the retroaortic margin in this patient is almost absent, but there is a fairly well formed posterior margin. In this movie loop, we can notice that there is a near total absence of the posterior margin and a small stub of the retroaortic anterosuperior margin seen behind the ascending aorta. Now we move on to the vertical cut that is the 90 degree cut. This slicing of the heart in 90 degree plane will go through the superior and inferior vena cava and so is called as the bicaval view. Here we will be slicing through the atrial septum from the superior to inferior margin of the atrial septal defect. This is a three dimensional echocardiogram. A view from the right atrial side. The right atrial in surface of the intraatrial septum is displayed. We can see the superior vena cava in the top, the inferior vena cava orifice in the bottom and the atrial septum displayed very clearly. The margin that is located below the atrial septal defect is the inferior margin and the margin that is above the atrial septal defect in relation to the superior vena cava is the superior margin. In this 90 degree view or the bicaval view, we show a large atrial septal defect. The superior vena cava is displayed on the right hand of the screen. The inferior vena cava margin or the inferior margin is seen on the left hand of the screen. There is a small stub of a superior vena cava margin, but very well developed inferior vena cava margin. When we angulate the probe further beyond 90 degree to around 120 to 130 degree, we start visualizing the atrial septum in a plane that passes through the antero inferior mitral margin and the postero superior margin. This display of the atrial septal defect in 120 degree 
shows that the slice will be passing through the antero inferior AV valve margin and the postero superior margin. Very close to postero superior margin will be the entry point of the right upper pulmonary vein into the left atrium. We are able to appreciate the right upper pulmonary vein entering the left atrium in the right hand of the screen. So at around 120 degrees we will be getting the posterior superior margin on the right hand of the screen and the antero inferior margin on the left hand of the screen. When we freeze the frame in about 120 degrees, we can appreciate the posterior superior and antero inferior margins which are shown with annotation. We can notice that the antero inferior margin is in very close relation to the tricuspid valve and the posterior superior margin is in close relation to the right upper pulmonary vein. So to give a recap, we have shown all the transthoracic and transesophageal echocardiographic views and how to identify all the different margins of an atrial septal defect namely the superior and inferior margins, the retroaortic or antero superior margin, the mitral or antero inferior margin and the last posterior margin or the pulmonary venous margin. Let us now analyze one particular defect in all the views. This is an example of a transesophageal echocardiogram of a large atrial septal defect. This cut goes at a zero degree plane. That means we are horizontally slicing the heart. What is seen on the right hand of the screen is the anterior margin and what is seen on the left hand of the screen is the posterior margin. If we push the probe a little deeper in the esophagus, we will be cutting the atrial septum at a lower plane where we will have a display of the atrioventricular valves namely the mitral and tricuspid valve. If you pull the probe one or two centimeters, we will be slicing through the upper plane of the atrial septum which will be passing through the aortic root and ascending aorta. When we move on to around 40 degrees, we will start noticing the aortic root, a very small retroaortic margin a virtually absent posterior inferior margin. The posterior inferior margin is seen on the left hand of the screen and the antero superior retroaortic margin is seen on the right hand of the screen. In this 90 degree bicaval view, we are able to show the superior margin on the right hand of the screen on the small and deficient inferior margin on the left hand of the screen. A 3D echocardiogram with a volume rendering of the right atrial on fast view will give a complete perspective of all the margins. Some of the atrial septal defects will be multi-fenestrated defects. There will be multiple fenestrations in the region of Fossa Valis. On a subsified sagittal view with color flow imaging, we are able to appreciate multiple color jets from the left atrium into the right atrium through this multi-fenestrated atrial septal defect. In this color compare mode, we can appreciate at least four different color jets from the left atrium into the right atrium. This will be called as a multifenestrated atrial septal defect. While evaluating a multifenestrated atrial septal defect for the purposes of planning an intervention with a cribriform ASD device, 
we need to measure the entire length and width of the fenestrated atrial septum. The choice and size of the cripriform occluder will depend on this measurement of the entire fenestrated septal length. We need to differentiate between multifenestrated atrial septal defect, which means multiple small fenestrations from multiple large atrial septal defects. This is an example of multiple large atrial septal defect. There is one large anterosuperior atrial septal defect seen at the upper half of the screen and one moderate sized postro inferior defect seen on the lower half of the screen. There are two large color jets that come from the left atrium into the right atrium. When we measure the two atrial septal defects, the larger anterosuperior defect measures about 19 mm and the moderate sized postro inferior defect measures about 6 mm. These two defects are separated by a margin which is more than 6 mm. Usually these defects are not amenable for closure with a single device and will need multiple devices. Let us see another example of a patient with multiple atrial septal defects. In this transesophageal echo on zero degree horizontal plane, we are able to appreciate a large secondum atrial septal defect with absent retroiotic margin and fairly well formed posterior margin. When we do a color Doppler interrogation of the same patient, we can notice that at the left hand end of the screen, a very small additional posterior defect. So there is a large retroaortic atrial septal defect in this patient along with a very small defect on the posterior margin of the intraatrial septum. This is another example of a transesophageal echo. In 90 degree bicaval view, there are two defects shown. There is one larger superior defect and one smaller inferior defect. There is a small rim of tissue that separates these two defects and the rim of the tissue is less than 4 millimeters. On this bicaval view, we clearly appreciate the larger superior defect and the smaller inferior defect with a small strand of structure that separates the two. So these are defects that are located one below the other. When we visualize the same two defects on a three-dimensional echo and view the atrial septum from the left atrium, we visualize the large superior defect on the right hand of the screen and a smaller inferior defect on the left hand of the screen with a small bridge of tissue that is running between the two defects. Usually these defects can be closed with a single device through the superior larger defect. When we do three-dimensional echocardiogram, we can't measure the atrial septal defect by placing cursors. We need to use the image grid. In this image grid, each of the dots are separated by 5 mm each. So the superior defect measures roughly 20 mm in its largest dimension and the inferior defect measures roughly 8 to 9 mm in its largest dimension. Sometimes there can be more than two defects. Each of the defects may be individually be large 
and so they cannot be called as multifenestrated atrial septal defects. We can notice in this color Doppler interrogation that there are at least three jets of flows across the intraatrial septum and each one of the defect is anatomically looking significant. When we view the same on three-dimensional echocardiogram from the left atrial surface, we are able to appreciate two large defects within the fossa ovalis and a third defect located immediately above the limbus of fossa ovalis on the right hand of the screen. In the previous example shown where there were three defects, a single device was placed through the central defect and all the three ASDs were closed with a single large device. While analyzing a patient with multiple atrial ostium secundum defects, we need to answer the following questions. Are the defects close to each other and the bridging strands of atrial septum that are seen between the defects very thin? If that is the case, usually they can be closed with a single occluder device. If they are far apart from each other, what is the extent of separation? If they are separated by more than 6 to 7 millimeters, often they will require two devices. We can do a three-dimensional echocardiogram to understand a good spatial perspective of the relationship between the defects. If there is a very small additional defect, we need to analyze it whether we can leave the ASD without any intervention. The small additional defect will lead to a very small left right shunt and so can be left behind. We need to identify is it a multifenestrated CU like atrial septum in which case all the individual defects will be very small but the cumulative shunt will be much more due to multiple defects. When multiple atrial septal defects are located at a far distance from each other, if the separating margin is more than 6 to 7 millimeters, then they will need more than one device to close them. This is an example of two atrial septal defect devices placed in a patient with multiple atrial septal defect. We need to understand that when two devices are placed in the intraatrial septum, they will never be in the same plane because atrial septal defect may be a curved structure. So during the echocardiographic evaluation of a patient who had multiple devices, we will notice some angulations between the two devices and this is common. In this epical four chamber view, we can notice that the two devices are at two different planes with an angulation between the two devices. An interventional closure of an atrial septal defect will depend on all the following echocardiographic features. The location of the defect, the number of the defects, the margins of the defect, the size of the defect in relation to the size of the patient. What is the access for the delivery of the device? Or in other words, is there a well-developed inferior vena cava? We need to identify inferior vena cava anomalies like interrupted IVC. Echocardiogram will also help in intraprocedural guidance and in post-device follow-up. In most of the atrial septal defect interventions, 
echocardiographic guidance is very crucial in completion of the procedure. This is a 3D echocardiogram done during the procedure of atrial septal defect device closure. We see the atrial septal defect as viewed from the left atrial surface. Initially, a catheter and guide wire is passed through the atrial septal defect from the inferior vena cava into the left atrium through the atrial septal defect. The 3D transesophageal echo shows the passage of the catheter and guide wire through the atrial septal defect. Here the left atrial disc is fully opened up. The sheath and the cable can be seen on the right atrium and the plane of the intraatrial septum is well visualized. The left atrium and right atrium are marked LA and RA. After a complete device deployment, we are able to appreciate on 3D echo the left atrial disc surface as seen from the left atrium. When we close very large atrial septal defects, we use a balloon assisted technique. The position of the balloon, the position of the left atrial and right atrial disc can be very clearly identified when we are using an intraprocedural transesophageal echocardiogram. During the deployment of an atrial septal occluder device, a small push-pull wiggle is done to identify the stability of the device across the atrial septum. In this loop that is shown, during the push-pull wiggle, the device gets displaced from the plane of the atrial septum into the left atrium and this is very clearly shown on the transesophageal echo guidance. After a successful placement of the ASD device and release of the cable, a transesophageal echo will confirm the adequacy of deployment of the occluder across the ASD. We need to appreciate all the margins going through between the two discs of the septal occluder device. In this 110 degree view, we can notice the postrocipiria margin and the anteroinferior margin entering on into the waist of the device. In a post-interventional follow-up, we need to identify the profile of the device, the stability of the device. An apical four-chamber view shows the device in good position. In a parasternal short axis view, we will notice that the device is getting flared in the anterior retroaortic margin. In the post-device deployment echocardiogram, we need to identify if there is any effusions. The presence of a significant effusion will mean possibility of a device erosion causing pericardial effusion. However, we need to know that there is an acute shrinkage of the heart, a reduction in the right atrial and right ventricle cavity immediately after an ASD device closure. The pericardial cavity which was stretched previously by the cardiac enlargement will lag behind the reduction in the size of the heart and so this may cause a translucency or echolucency around the heart and does not it always indicate an effusion due to a cardiac erosion by the device. A very unstable device may get embolized and this is an example of an embolization of the atrial septal defect occluder into the right ventricle. The right ventricle is dilated 
due to the large shun through the atrial septal defect and the device is seen in the right ventricular cavity. We can notice on color Doppler echocardiogram that there is no restriction to tricuspid or pulmonary blood flows caused by this embolized device. In this apical four chamber view, the embolized device is seen in the RV cavity. We can notice that there is no tricuspid inflow gradients. There is no tricuspid inflow obstruction. Sometimes the atrial septal defect occluder devices are fenestrated. This fenestration is done to allow a pop-off of blood flow from one of the atrium to the other atrium. In patients who are having high pulmonary vascular resistance, when they are exercising, there may be an elevation of the pulmonary artery pressure and resultant elevation of the right atrial pressure. In these patients, placing a fenestration in the occluder device will help a right to left flows, thereby maintaining the cardiac output of the patient. Similarly, in older patients who are having elevated left ventricular end diastolic pressures due to small non-compliant left ventricle or significant diastolic dysfunction of the left ventricle, leaving behind a small fenestration in the atrial septal defect device will result in a pop-off for the left atrium by causing a left-right shunt. This is an example of a patient who had high pulmonary vascular resistance where a small fenestration was placed through the device. We can see the color flow through the device in the middle of the device. As a continuation from second atrial septal defect, we will look at some examples of patent for Amanovale. Patent for Amanovale may be associated with an atrial septal aneurysm. Atrial septal aneurysm is defined as an excursion of the atrial septum more than 15 millimeters. The base of the aneurysm should be more than 10 millimeters. Whenever a patent for Amanovale is associated with an atrial septal aneurysm, there is a high risk of thromboembolism. This is an example of an apical four chamber view showing a large atrial septal aneurysm. We can see the thin aneurysmal atrial septum bowing into the right atrium. When we look at the color flows through this atrial septal aneurysm, we can appreciate that there is a color flow through the thin portions of the atrial septal aneurysm and we are able to see the left to right color flows. On measuring the base of the atrial septal aneurysm, we find that the base is about 18 millimeters. The excursion of atrial septal aneurysm is considered significant when it is more than 15 millimeter. Here the excursion is almost 17 millimeter. Let us analyze the same atrial septal aneurysm on a transesophageal echocardiogram. We can see the thin aneurysmal part of the atrial septal aneurysm bowing into the right atrium most of the time, but transiently there is a flip of this atrial septal aneurysm towards the left atrium. So there is a bidirectional movement of the floppy membrane of this atrial septal aneurysm. When we look at the color flows through this atrial septal aneurysm, we identify at least three, four jets of small blue color from the left atrium into the right atrium. When the patient is made to perform a valsalva maneuver, we identify that the atrial septal aneurysm, which was originally bowing into the right atrium, bows into the left atrium 
and there is a free bidirectional movement of this atrial septal aneurysmal flap. When we do an agitated saline contrast injection through one of the systemic veins, we can appreciate a good filling of the saline contrast on the right atrium and right ventricle and a small spillover of the contrast through the foramen ovale into the left atrium. These patients who have patent foramen ovale, atrial septal aneurysm with the right to left shunt of agitated saline contrast or at a higher risk of developing thromboembolic events and can stand a chance for paradoxical embolism. After this extensive description of secondum atrial septal defect and foramen ovale, we will now move on to sinus venosus defects. Sinus venosus defects are grouped as superior type of sinus venosus defects, which is also called SVC type of ASD. This is caused by unroofing of the right upper pulmonary vein. So the right upper pulmonary vein seems to drain in the region of superior vena cava atrial junction and there is a large defect high in the atrial septum communicating between the left atrium and the right atrium. The inferior type of sinus venosus defect is a very loosely described undefined entity. In fact, large secondum atrial septal defects without postero-inferior margins are sometimes referred to as inferior type of or IVC type of sinus venosus defects. Here, there is no margin between the right lower pulmonary vein orifice in the left atrium and the inferior venicaeval orifice in the right atrium. There is no clear cut embryological explanation for an inferior type of sinus venosus defect. But the superior type of sinus venosus defect is said to be due to unroofing of the right upper pulmonary vein. Let us first start with the poorly defined IVC type of sinus venosus defects. A secondum atrial septal defect with deficient postero inferior margin or absent postero inferior margin is sometimes referred to as IVC type of sinus venosus defect. In this subsified short axis view, we notice that there is no IVC inferior margin at all. So these defects will be called as IVC type of defects. On this subsified short axis view, a loop is shown demonstrating absent IVC or inferior margin. In this transesophageal echocardiogram, on a bicaval view, we can notice on certain frames that the IVC margin is totally becoming absent. On the same bicaval view, when we push the probe a little bit more deeper into the esophagus, we are able to appreciate a complete absence of the IVC inferior margin. This is the characteristic feature of an IVC type of defect. The reason for knowing about this inferior vena cable type of ASD is that interventional therapy is not feasible due to lack of postero inferior margin and surgery will be the recommended course of management. A still frame of the subsified short axis view shows the dimension of the atrial septal defect, the complete absence of the IVC margin. We can notice a small stub of tissue from the anterior lip of the IVC RA junction, which is the East Asian valve. If you don't identify such a prominent East Asian valve and close the atrial septal defect in such a way that the East Asian valve's margin are also stitched together, this will result in flow of the inferior vena cable blood 
after the surgical closure towards the left atrium. This is an example of a patient where the eustachian valve lips are sutured to the margins of the atrial septal defect. This defect was an inferior vena cable type of defect where there was no posterior and inferior margin. And so the lips of the eustachian valve was, uh, were identified as the inferior margin and a patch closure of the ASD was done. This resulted in a complete routing of the inferior vena cava towards the left atrium. When we do an agitated saline contrast from the femoral vein, we notice an immediate filling of the left atrium and the left ventricle. On a subsifoid short axis view, we can notice the inferior vena cava the prominent eustachian valve which has been sutured on to the atrial septal defect margins. The ASD patch is routing the IVC blood entirely towards the posterior left atrium. When the saline contrast injection is done from the femoral vein, we see the filling of the inferior vena cava and subsequent filling of the left atrium. On a subsified coronal view, we are able to appreciate an earlier filling of the left atrium when agitated saline is injected from the femoral vein. During the surgery, the eustachian valve margins have been stitched as a part of the ASD patch and so this results in flow of the blood from the inferior vena cava towards the left atrium. We can see a small residual defect with a bidirectional flow between the left atrium and the right atrium. On a subsified short axis view, we can see the inferior vena cava continuing towards the posterior left atrium as a result of this wrong surgical patching. On a color flow mapping, we can notice the color color flows of blood from the inferior vena cava entering the left atrium. This is another example of a similar patching of the ASD to the eustachian valve's margins. We can notice on this bicaval view of transesophageal echocardiogram the entire inferior vena cava inferior vena cava has been directed towards the left atrium. The atrial septal defect patch that has been placed surgically is attached to the eustachian valve which comes off from the anterior lip of the IVC RA junction. Let us now move on to the superior vena cava type of ASDs or SVC type of sinus venosus ASD. These are more common than the IVC type of sinus venosus defect. On a subsified short axis view, we are able to appreciate a defect in the atrial septum very close to the SVCRA junction. And we can see that the superior vena cava straddles the atrial septal defect. This is the characteristic feature of an SVC type of ASD. When we look at the color flows from the superior vena cava towards the right atrium, we can notice that there is a color flow from the left atrium to right atrium through the SVC type of sinus venosus defect and the superior vena cava is straddling the ASD. In this still frame, we can notice the straddling of the SVC RA junction over the atrial septal defect. This is the characteristic feature of a SVC type of sinus venosus ASD. This is an example of a three-dimensional transesophageal echocardiogram. We are viewing from above and the superior vena cava orifice is shown in the center of the image. We can notice that the entire right upper pulmonary vein is draining into the lateral wall of the superior vena cava. An abnormal drainage of the right upper pulmonary vein into the SVC RA junction is almost always seen in all patients with SVC type of sinus venosus defects.
the repair of a SVC type of ASD is done by re-roofing the right upper pulmonary vein by patching across the atrial septal defect. Very often, following a surgical repair of this superior vena cable type of ASD, there will be a mild flow turbulence of blood flow from the superior vena cava into the right atrium. In this subsified sagittal view, we can notice that there is a flow turbulence of blood flow from the right superior vena cava into the right atrium. This is due to a mild narrowing of the superior vena cava atrial junction. When we interrogate the flow gradients across this superior vena cava right atrial junction, we find a mean gradient of around 6 millimeters of mercury. This turbulence is quite common after surgical repair of SVC type of ASDs. If an atrial septal defect located in the most superior portion of the septum is not correctly identified as a sinus venosus ASD, sometimes the entire superior vena cava origin may be identified as the ASD and patch closed. In one of the patients who had a sinus venosus ASD, a patching was done in such a way that the superior vena cava got rooted into the left atrium. Following the surgical repair, when an agitated saline contrast injection was made in the arm vein, the superior vena cava flow into the left atrium was seen. This is a long axis view from transesophageal echocardiogram showing the superior vena cava wrongly connected into the left atrium. There is also a small residual atrial septal defect. Since the superior vena cava now has been rooted into the left atrium, the right upper pulmonary vein which was originally draining in the lateral wall of the right superior vena cava is also now draining into the left atrium. On a transesophageal echocardiogram in zero degree view, we identify that the whole of the superior vena cava now connected towards the left atrium. The region of the right upper pulmonary vein which was draining into the lateral wall of right superior vena cava. The right upper pulmonary venous blood also goes into the left atrium. Let's go on to one of the very rare types of atrial septal defect. This is coronary sinus ASD. This is also called as Raghib's ASD. There is an unroofing of the coronary sinus. This leads to flow of blood from the left atrium into the coronary sinus and which then allows the left atrial blood to be shunted into the right atrium. Anatomically, this ASD will be located in the region of coronary sinus ostium and the coronary sinus ostium will be dilated. It is very often associated with persistence of left superior vena cava. In this subsifard short axis view, we identify an atrial septal defect in the most posterior and inferior portion of the atrial septum. This is the region where the coronary sinus ostium will normally be found. We can notice that there is a flow convergence of the blood from left atrium through this atrial septal defect into the right atrium. On a subsified coronal view, we can identify the dilated coronary sinus and the flow from the coronary sinus into the right atrium. We can also notice that the left atrial blood enters the coronary sinus through the unroofed portion of the coronary sinus, thereby causing a flow from the left atrium into the coronary sinus and subsequently into the right atrium. On an apical four chamber view, we notice the dilatation of the right atrium and right ventricle due to the left right shunt through the ASD. On a posterior sweep, we can identify the dilated coronary sinus as well. When we look at the suprasternal view, we are able to see a persistence of left superior vena cava. From this subsified coronal view, we notice two superior vena cava 
the right superior vena cava is draining into the right atrium the left superior vena cava is draining into the left atrium due to the unroofing of the coronary sinus the left atrial blood finally enters the coronary sinus through this unroofing and finally comes into the right atrium this causes a left right shunt and this is described as the coronary sinus type of ASD or Raghib's type of ASD. In this still frame of the subsified coronal view, we can clearly see the red flows from the right superior vena cava into the right atrium and the left superior vena cava into the left atrial cavity. In this another still frame, the left superior vena cable flow into the left atrium is even seen far better. In this three dimensional echocardiogram, the right atrial anterior free wall has been cropped off. We are able to see the right superior vena cava entering the right atrium. We are seeing the intraatrial septal surface through the right atrium. We can identify the tricuspid valve. There is a large atrial septal defect in the postero inferior portion of the atrial septum in the region of coronary sinus. It actually represents a dilated coronary sinus ostium. This is the coronary sinus ASD. This is one of the causes for systemic desaturation in a patient with atrial septal defect. The persistence of the left superior vena cava into the left atrium through the unroofed coronary sinus results in desaturated blood from the left superior vena cava entering the left atrium and causing an aortic desaturation. Coronary sinus ASD is one of the causes of desaturation in a patient who presents with clinical features of atrial septal defect. There can be other reasons also. Sometimes the inferior vena cava blood can stream through the atrial septal defect into the left atrium if there is a very prominent institution valve. If an atrial septal defect is associated with hyperplasia of the tricuspid valve or right ventricle, there can be a right to left shunt at the atrial septal level. The same phenomenon can happen if there is a severe valvar or infundibular pulmonary stenosis with elevated right ventricular end diastolic pressures. In patients with secondary atrial septal defect, with severe pulmonary hypertension and high pulmonary vascular resistance, once again there can be a shunt reversal and they can have systemic desaturation. An entity called ortho orthodeoxy or platypnea syndrome is also associated with small secondary atrial septal defects or patent foramen avail associated with right left shunt on certain postures of the patient. Streaming of the inferior vena cava blood through the atrial septal defect is seen whenever the eustachian valve is very prominent and the eustachian valve which is attached to the anterior lip of the IVC RA junction directs the IVC blood posteriorly towards the atrial septal defect. In this example, we can identify the IVC blood streaming towards the left atrium through the ASD. The subsified short axis view shows a prominent eustachian valve. Posteriorly, the region of the fossa valve is, is very thin and neurismal and keeps bowing into the left atrium and the eustachian valve directs the IVC blood through the moderate sized atrial septal defect into the left atrium. In the color flows, we can clearly identify that there is a right left shunt the IVC blood gets streamed towards the left atrium. The rigid eustachian valve directs the IVC blood through the floppy portion of the fossa valis into the left atrium. In some instances, the eustachian valves can cause profound right left shunt and marked systemic desaturation. On an agitated saline injection from the femoral vein, in one of the patients who had such a phenomenon, we can notice an abundance of saline contrast entry from the right atrium into the left atrium 
caused by the eustachian valve causing systemic desaturation after discussing second atrial septal defects patent for amana whale followed by sinus stenosis defects and coronary sinus defects now we move on to primary atrial septal defect which is also described as partial ab canal defects here the atrial septal defect is located in the most antero inferior portion of the atrial septum the tricuspid and the mitral valve will be at the same level on echocardiogram there won't be an offset between the right sided and left sided atrioventricular valves the mitral valve will often have a cleft in the anterior mitral leaflet which is the zone of opposition between the superior and bri inferior bridging leaflets the cleft in the anterior mitral leaflet which is also called as the zone of opposition between the superior and inferior bridging leaflet will often result in some degree of mitral regurgitation we can notice the mild central mitral regurgitation through the cleft in this transesophageal echo the mitral regurgitation in a cleft arises from the thick rolled edges along the zone of opposition a three dimensional echocardiogram helps to identify the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet very well this is a view from the roof of the left atrium we are seeing the atrial surface of the mitral valve we identify here that the mitral valve is actually a three leaflet structure what is seen on the left side of the screen is the left mural leaflet what is seen on the right side of the screen is the superior and the inferior bridging leaflet we can identify the aorta which is displaced far more anteriorly the cleft is directed towards the ventricular septum when we freeze the frame in the 3d echo we can identify the cleft very well the arrow points to the region of the cleft the cleft in a partial av canal is directed towards the ventricular septum because of the cleft the mitral valve looks like a three leaflet structure when we view the cleft from the ventricular surface we can identify that the cleft is clearly directed towards the interventricular septum the ivs refers to the interventricular septum the cavity of the left ventricle is shown on the right side of the screen and the cavity of the right ventricle is shown on the left side of the screen it is important to recognize the cleft of anterior mitral leaflet in association with partial av canal defects here the cleft is directed towards the interventricular septum there can be some patients who have a cleft in the anterior mitral leaflet unassociated with partial av canal defect they are referred as isolated clefts of the anterior mitral leaflet in such cases the cleft will be directed towards the left ventricular outflow tract on a subsified coronal view we can identify the atrioventricular valve and the aorta the aortic valve is displaced anteriorly if you see the distance between the atrioventricular valve and the left ventricular apex it is called as the inlet axis if you see the distance between the aortic valve and the apex of the left ventricle that is called as the outlet axis in normal hearts the inlet axis and the outlet axis will be equal in their dimensions however in av canals or in atrioventricular canals the inlet axis will be shorter than the outlet axis which means the distance between the atrioventricular valve and the apex of the left ventricle is shorter than the distance between the aortic annulus and the left ventricular apex this causes the gooseneck deformity it is clearly shown in this picture 
in the subsified short axis view the mitral valve will be visualized very well we can notice that the mitral valve is split into two components the superior bridging and the inferior bridging components and the zone of opposition between the two components which is also called as the cleft is identified very clearly on subsified coronal view we can identify a large prima ASD with a large left right shunt through the atrial septal defect epical four chamber view again shows the atrial septal defect in the most epical region of the intraatrial septum it's located in the antero inferior portion of the atrial septum There are multiple caudal attachments that come from the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet, which will be the zone of opposition between the superior and inferior bridging leaflets. This cordae will get attached to the interventricular septum, and if these attachments are complete, there won't be any ventricular septal defect. And this caudal attachment with each left ventricular systole can bow and bulge into the right ventricular inflow tract. This is called as the tricuspid pouch. In this epical view, we can identify the thin caudal attachments from the mitral valve getting attached to the interventricular septum and bowing into the right ventricular inflow with each systole. There is also a trivial tricuspid regurgitation. Short axis views are the best place to identify the cleft. In this magnified view on a parasternal short axis, we can identify the mitral valve. The anterior mitral leaflet is split into two components. The gap between the two components is the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet. On a parasternal short axis view, when we do a color Doppler interrogation, we often identify that the mitral regurgitation is through this zone of opposition between the superior and inferior bridging leaflet or in other words through the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet. The free edges of the cleft of anterior mitral leaflet often gets thickened and rolled with advancing age and most of the clefts will be associated with some degree of mitral regurgitation. Surgical correction of a primum atrial septal defect is done by a pericardial patch sutured around the margins of the atrial septum, septal defect. Some patients with primum atrial septal defect can also have an additional secondum atrial septal defect. In this epical four chamber view, we identify a large primum ASD and a moderate sized secondum atrial septal defect as well. After a discussion on primum atrial septal defect, let us move on to common atrium and single atrium. We need to identify what is a common atrium and what is a single atrium. The common atrium is an extension of a partial AV canal defect. The AV valve is common though well divided into two AV valve rings. So it is always associated with the cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet and the ECG will show a left axis deviation which is typical for any partial AV canal defect. Single atrium is essentially a very very large secondary atrial septal defect. The atrioventricular valves are normal. The mitral valve will not have any cleft. ECG will show either a normal axis or a right axis as in any other case of a secondary atrial septal defect. Since the atrial septum is largely absent in both these conditions, there will be some admixture at the atrial level and so there will be some systemic desaturation in these patients. An epical view of a patient who had common atrium, this shows complete absence of the atrial septum. The tricuspid and the mitral valve getting attached in almost the same plane. There is no offsetting between the right and the left atrioventricular valves. 
on transesophageal echocardiogram, we notice that the right and the left atrioventricular valves are attached to the same level. There is no offsetting and a complete absence of the atrial septum. All these patients will have a mild degree of systemic desaturation due to admixture of systemic and pulmonary venous blood at the atrial level. All patients with common atrium will have a cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet and this cleft can result in varying degrees of mitral regurgitation. Common atrium is commonly associated with Ellis Van Creveld syndrome which is also called chondroectodermal dysplasia. In this syndrome there will be a disproportionate short stature. The short stature is caused by a short limb dwarfism. There will be associated dysplasia of the nails, multiple frenulum of the upper lip, the trunk will be well developed but the long bones will be shortened. They also will have post-axial polydactyly of both the upper limbs and lower limbs. When we look at the three-dimensional echocardiogram, from the atrial surface, we will notice a complete cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet, which refers to the zone of opposition between the superior and inferior bridging leaflets. The findings on the mitral valve will almost be similar to a partial AV canal or a primum ASD. The cleft of the anterior mitral leaflet or the zone of opposition between the superior and inferior bridging leaflet is shown with an arrow in this three dimensional atrial view. Lutum Basha syndrome refers to a second atrial septal defect associated with rheumatic mitral valve disease. The mitral valve lesion which may either be mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation or a combination increases the left atrial shunt and causes severe pulmonary arterial hypertension and marked right atrial and right ventricular enlargement. This is a still frame of an apical view of a patient with lutum basha syndrome. We can notice that the mitral annulus is mildly dilated. The mitral valve leaflets are thickened and rigid and there is a large atrial septal defect. A color Doppler interrogation shows a large left right shun, dilatation of the right atrium and right ventricle, moderate to severe degree of tricuspid regurgitation. Many of these patients will have significant pulmonary arterial hypertension which will worsen the grade of tricuspid regurgitation. On a color flow interrogation of the mitral valve, we notice that there is a turbulence to the mitral inflow indicative of a mild degree of mitral stenosis and there is a moderate to severe posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation as well. Let us now move on to atrial septal defects associated with severe pulmonary hypertension. Any patient who has an atrial septal defect with severe pulmonary hypertension, if the defect is clearly a large defect measuring more than 2 cm, then the atrial septal defect can be attributed as a cause of the pulmonary hypertension. However, if the patient is having severe pulmonary hypertension and the size of the atrial septal defect is much less than 20 mm or 2 cm, the shunt through that defect would not have been severe enough to cause a yeah, flow dependent pulmonary hypertension. In these patients, it is presumed that they are all idiopathic pulmonary hypertension with an associated second atrial septal defect. We need to have a large atrial septal defect measuring more than 2 centimeters to cause significant pulmonary hypertension due to the shunt.
This is a transesophageal echocardiogram of a patient who had features of severe pulmonary hypertension. You can identify the dilated tricuspid valve, the dilated right ventricle with poor right ventricular contractility. The anteroinferior margin of the atrial septal defect is very thin, aneurysmal and has got a bidirectional movement into both the atria. An interrogation of the tricuspid regurgitation jet from apical four chamber view shows a predicted RV systolic pressure of 95 millimeters of mercury added to the right atrial pressure. This is indicative of very severe pulmonary arterial hypertension. On a transesophageal echocardiogram, when we interrogate the color flows, even though there is a predominant left right shunt, we can notice some red flows from the right atrium into the left atrium on certain phases of the cardiac cycle. So this is an indicator of bidirectional flows and an early feature of high pulmonary vascular resistance. In this module of echocardiographic evaluation of atrial septal defect, we started off with second atrial septal defect. We went through identification of all the margins of the second atrial septal defect in different transthoracic and transesophageal views. Had a brief discussion on patent foramen ovale and atrial septal aneurysm with right to left shunt during certain phases of cardiac cycle. We then moved on to the sinus venosus ASD, described what is a superior vena cable type of defect and what is an inferior vena cable type of defect. We had a few examples of coronary sinus ASDs and described what is a Ragib's ASD. Then we moved on to primum atrial septal defects, single atrium and common atrium, a few slides on lutum basher syndrome and atrial septal defect associated with high pulmonary vascular resistance. Thank you.